Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Full Spectrum series. I am Nick Valentino. I'm an academic counselor in the Hagem Dean's office, and I am your host for the series. Uh, the Full Set Spectrum series is comprised of introductory lectures from our Hagem faculty. Uh, this is the opportunity to ask uh, faculty about their program, uh, their research, the types of challenges engineers in their field work to uh, solve. Uh, before we get into the program, I just want to remind you that we are going to be on, on again next week. Uh, biomedical Engineering with Dr. Amy Lerner. That's Friday, October 22nd, 2 to 3. Uh, we will be updating the Facebook and Instagram pages uh, with this information. If you can't stay for the whole program, uh, these videos will be on the uh, Hagen School Facebook page, the Instagram, and YouTube. Um, if you'd like a chance to win a prize, please put your name in the chat or on the uh, Facebook broadcasts and indicate if you're a current or prospective student, uh, alum, staff, faculty, or any other part of the university community. <laughs> this is C. Dean Funkenbush is showing what the possibilities are. It's your chance to have a chemical engineering mind. Um, during the lecture, I'm, I'm going to be monitoring the chat uh, for the uh, Zoom and on Facebook Live. So uh, you feel free to, to post your questions and we'll be have uh, time for questions at the end. Uh, this session is, is presented by Dr. Mark Borisov. Uh, Dr. Borisov is Assistant uh, Professor of Chemical Engineering. He earned his PhD in chemical engineering at Columbia University in 2015. Let me know if I got any of that wrong, and I will turn it over to you, uh, uh, Dr. Porsa. All right. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. This is actually uh, the first time I've ever live streamed anything onto Facebook, so that's a, an exciting first. Um, well, it's good to, to be here, and thanks again for the invitation uh, to give this lecture and represent chemical engineering and talk a little bit about uh, our program. I just want to make sure, can you see my screen? Yeah. So my slides are coming through? Perfect. Um, let me just kind of reorient things over here. And all right, very good. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about chemical engineering, give you an introduction to what chemical en engineers do, tell you a little bit of information about the chemical engineering program here at U of R, and then I'll also talk a little bit about my group's research and give you some overview as to the kinds of problems we're trying to solve today. So to start off, uh, what is a chemical engineer? So we're gonna address how they impact our world, how they approach problems, what you can do with a chemical engineering degree. And if anyone out there can name one chemical engineer, if you, if you know anyone, um, I've asked this question numerous times in the past and my favorite, most, the most popular answer I get is they say me, um, but if you can name someone other than myself, anybody, <laughs> any thoughts? <laughs> well, one of the most famous in the world is uh, Xi Jinping, the president of the People's Republic of China, is a chemical engineer. Another one really famous, but for different reasons, is uh, Dolph Lundgren or Ivan Drago from the Rocky IV movie. He's a chemical engineer uh, turned actor. And so to tell you a little bit about what chemical engineering is, um, what we do is we take basic sciences and we have raw materials and we use those basic science principles combined with those raw materials to make valuable products, and ideally while protecting and improving the environment. So for example, really classic chemical engineering processes, crude oil, so taking a oil out of the ground, converting it into gasoline, kerosene, monomers, then taking those monomers, building them up bigger and bigger to make ethylene, polyethylene, um, all different types of uh, plastics and, and, and things that we need for everyday life. Other examples, silicon, so taking silicon and making it into uh, integrated circuits, taking inorganics, making things like glass and ceramics, or there's also the, the bio side, so things like biomass and glucose and converting those into biodiesel, fine chemicals, pharmaceuticals. And really with all of these different um, processes, what chemical engineers do is we take chemical reactions, catalyst separation, and we try to figure out how to integrate these uh, unit operations to improve humanity and make uh, cheaper, easier, cleaner products. So a chemical engineer is not um, someone who engineers chemicals is my, one of my favorite definitions using the, the phrase in the definition, but it's not a chemist who works in manufacturing or an engineer who works in a chemical setting, um, not a glorified plumber, although it may help you in your house with, with your plumbing tasks. Um, and it's uh, an, not an engineer who works in a dirty industry and it's definitely not an easy to enter profession. Um, and the, so, so this is important too, when we start to think about, well, what's, exactly different between chemical engineering and chemistry. Uh, so chemists, chemists are much more fundamental on a much smaller scale. So chemists discover fundamental laws of nature, 
they'll make a brand new material or compound for the first time. So for example, they'll make a small vial on the order of maybe a couple of grams of a, of a new drug, but um, they won't necessarily make that on a scale where it can reach everybody. So we can think about like the, the COVID vaccine and it's one thing to make enough vaccine for two people. It's another thing to make enough vaccine for 7 billion people. And so a chemist may have initially discovered we know how to make this vaccine, we can make it on a small scale, but then they'll need the help of a chemical engineer to apply that chemistry, optimize the system and figure out how do we go from just a few grams or a few milliliters to enough for everybody. But um, it's clear that we need good collaboration between the two disciplines to achieve, to achieve success and to solve some of these most difficult problems. Um, an example that, that, that I think uh, everyone here has probably interacted with is a post-it note. And this is a great collaboration between a chemist and a chemical engineer where uh, both of these uh, people, Spencer Silver and Art Fry, worked at 3M. And Spencer Silver was an organic chemist who discovered an adhesive that had good tack. So that means it doesn't require a lot of force and it could stick to something, but low peel. So it would be easy to remove it. It wouldn't be like you'd stick it to, to a surface and then it would be very hard to remove. And so he made this by, by making this cross-linked microsphere suspension. And so he worked with Art Fry, who was the chemical engineer, and who Art was working in new product development. And he was frustrated with bookmarks. He would put in pieces of paper to, to bookmark his church book and they'd all fall out. And so he talked to his friend, Spencer Silver, and he said, hey, Spencer, can you give me some of that adhesive? I wanna put it on my, my, uh, my, my paper to, to make a better bookmark. And thus, there you have the post-it note was, was born and collaboration between a chemist and chemical engineers. Um, and so moving forward, other than post-it notes, chemical engineers are really present all over modern society. So from things like we mentioned, integrated circuits to manufacturing drugs, pharmaceuticals, to making photovoltaics and uh, tarnishing uh, solar energy and uh, the organic LED, which was uh, developed by and invented by a emeritus professor at U of R in the chemical engineering department, Ching Tang. And um, chemical engineers are present in modern society, but the, uh, the discipline is not so easy to enter. There aren't so many chemi, chemi degrees awarded each year. These numbers are, are from a few years ago. It's the only uh, available data I could find, but we see chemis are, are much lower than that of Mechie cities or electrical engineers. Um, but one thing I don't have on here is our uh, starting salary is also uh, one of the highest. So we're, we're one of the, the uh, very high demand profession that if you enter chemical engineering, it's relatively easy to, to find plenty of employment after graduation. And so moving forward, chemical engineering has been a key piece of the petrochemical industry. So the petrochemical industry is really combining all of those core disciplines of chemical engineering into taking oil out of the ground and converting it to all these things that we need from jet fuel to polymers, to pharmaceuticals, to bulk and fine chemicals. Um, it's the world's largest industry and about one of every $3, so, so a third of all GDP involves some kind of catalytic or chemical engineering process. So chemical engineering really is um, indispensable with our uh, energy industry. However, what we're trying to do now is with fossil fuels getting more expensive, with the environmental burden associated with all those uh, CO2 and methane emissions that are warming the earth and causing all kinds of uh, negative effects, we want to start thinking about how do we use different feedstocks other than petrochemicals to make the same compounds that we still need. And we'll do this the same way we did it with, with the, the petrochemicals and crude oil, is we'll start with things like microalgae, plant seeds, animal fat, cellulose, look to the chemical engineering core, so transport phenomena, thermodynamics, kinetics, uh, separations, process control, integrate those two things together to make these same chemicals, but with different feedstocks, relying on uh, the chemi dis cornerstone discipline. And so really, I think this, this, this idea of, um, of chemical engineering is, 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 is so prevalent um, in terms of just making stuff and scaling processes up that there'll always be places for chemical engineers at the forefront of figuring out, well, what's the new way we're gonna make this thing or that thing? And, and chemi chemi chemical engineering is really uh, completely in indispensable. Um, we can also look at, at chemical engineering in terms of saving energy. 
So what I have here is a Sankey diagram. And what this diagram shows are different sources of energy in the US as we move down the left hand uh, part of the diagram. And what we notice is in 2016, the United States used 97.3 quads of energy. And that's 97.3 quadrillion BTUs of energy. So uh, almost 100 quads of energy. And on the left here, it breaks down how all of the energy was used. So we, we um, have a little bit of, of solar energy that we made, a little bit of nuclear, hydroelectric, but we see natural gas, coal, petroleum, uh, the fossil fuels really dominate our energy landscape. And what also is, is noticeable in this diagram, if we move from left to right, we see these uh, kind of ominous looking gray bars. And so for example, if we look at electricity generation, we see that we generated 37.5 quads of electricity in 2016. And that was from coal, natural gas, nuclear energy, hydro, a whole combination. And of that 37.5 quads, only 12.6 was actually used in residential, commercial, industrial applications. The remaining 24.9 quads of energy is completely rejected as heat. It's gone, it's in the atmosphere. We can't do anything with it anymore. And so one, one big piece of this in chemical engineering is how do we get more efficient? How do we move away some, from some of these less efficient things like petroleum, where you see this very big gray bar relative to the more desirable darker gray bar to, to other energy sources that are more efficient, that waste less energy, that in turn allow us to emit less CO2. And one of the ways we can do that is through separation processes. So separation processes account for half of the energy consumed by United States industries. And this is because imagine we're separating a barrel of oil. One of the ways we do that is we heat it up and it comes apart based on boiling point. So the very light stuff like methane, ethane, the gases come out first. Then you get things that are a little heavier like butane for your gas grill. They get a little heavier like octane to drive your car. And then they get a little heavier for diesel fuel. And then at the very heaviest fraction, are things like asphalt and, and tar that we use to pave roads. Um, that's a very energy intensive process because we have to heat it up, get it hot, boil everything, pull everything apart. And now what we're thinking about in, in chemical engineering is how can we separate things uh, more efficiently, putting less energy in to get the same products out. And so one way of doing this is using membranes perhaps. Uh, another important application is for nuclear power. There's more uranium than we could ever need present in seawater to, to power uh, our planet for hundreds and hundreds of years. But the challenge is extracting that uranium without emitting much CO2. Um, and same idea for lithium ion batteries. So now that we have more and more electric vehicles, demand for lithium increases and increases. And the question is, how do we get that lithium? Well, there's plenty of lithium in the ocean. It's just, can we separate it out because it's not very concentrated? And then another, another piece of this is recycling. So and I was just talking with my graduate students about iPhones and how you can get a new iPhone every year um, with certain plans. And what happens with your old phone? Well, they take it back and they recycle a lot of these rare earth metals and valuable materials because they're much more concentrated in your phone, cheaper to extract than it is to, to go dig into the earth's crust and, and make a, a brand new of these uh, rare elements that are needed for, for the, all these integrated circuits and electrical applications. Um, so, so moving forward, we're constantly thinking about the forefront of chemical engineering and what we can do to help solve some of humanity's biggest challenges. And we can see that with the, with the 14 grand challenges uh, that have been issued by the National Academy of Engineering. And if we look at these grand challenges, chemical engineering is really directly tied to several of these. And for example, making solar energy more economical, making more efficient solar panels, Managing the nitrogen cycle, we'll talk about that in a little more detail. Um, clean water, so how can we purify water, especially in places that, that don't have access to clean water? Engineer better medicines. For example, the COVID vaccine was really remarkable how we got that made and distributed to millions and millions of people in really a year. And then uh, engineering's tools of scientific discovery, so how can we make more precise instruments or, and instruments that can tell us more about how the world works and develop carbon sequestration methods, and that's kind of really related to my group's research. So to give you some, some idea of how chemical engineers are tied into here, for example, engineering better medicines or improving public health, um, chemical engineers have been 
have achieved things like kidney dialysis, so that's the separation problem, um, like it's uh, running an artificial kidney, treating diabetes, diabetes, tissue engineering, drug delivery, and really moving forward is how do we do these things more efficiently and, and, and more cost effective, and we start thinking about scaling things down. So doing similar um, types of experiments, but on a small chip or making small nanoscale structures that can be used to improve uh, health within the human body. Other ideas are clean energy. So this ties into a lot of the grand challenges. Um, we've had achievements in traditional refining and synthesizing liquid fuels, uh, making biofuels. We're very, very good at getting electricity from coal, but coal is such a dirty pollutant making um, a, a, a lot of CO2 relative to the amount of energy we get out. So moving forward, we wanna think about maybe using hydrogen as a fuel. Can we make clean hydrogen? And then when we burn hydrogen, all that comes out is water. There's no CO2 at all when hydrogen is burned. Um, we are looking at solar and wind energy and nuclear energy as means of emitting less CO2. Other ideas are really reusing um, what we've already made. So we've put a lot of energy into making things like plastic, like polyethylene. And um, now in the United States, like plastics really don't get recycled. They get dumped into the recycling bin, but then they just end up in the trash in, the, in a landfill because there isn't, there, it's too expensive to break the polyethylene down, separate everything out, clean it up. The amount of energy and water you have to put in to do this process is really just, um, uh, it, it's, not, it's not worth the energy you're putting in. So there's, a, there's some thought now, instead of taking this plastic and recycling it, well, maybe we can upcycle it and turn it into something else. And the idea here is to take polyethylene, react it with a catalyst, and with the right kinds of reactions, you make these aromatic compounds, which are essentially benzene rings. So, so they, they're aromatic because they have odors to them, but they have all kinds of different applications. And the thought here would be instead of recycling the plastic, let's just make some other kind of raw material that isn't necessarily plastic, but could still be very useful. And so effectively be able to more efficiently use this, this product that might have only had a, a very short lifetime as let's say a plastic bottle and now we can make it into something else. Um, other, other ideas of, of clean energy are thinking about a hydrogen economy. So moving toward hydrogen, although it burns very clean, it only produces water, um, there's, there's many challenges associated with moving toward a hydrogen economy. So producing hydrogen, we need to be able to make the hydrogen without emitting CO2. That's a big challenge. It needs to be cheap. That's a big challenge. It needs to have high capacity. We need to be able to make enough so everybody can power their vehicle. Um, distribution and storage are two challenges that are also tied together. Um, right now, we're very good at moving liquids around. We have big liquid pipelines. We're built for gasoline. We're built for filling up our gas tanks in five minutes. That's how our infrastructure is set up. We're not really set up for moving around a very light gas um, all over the country. So we would typically have to store hydrogen at high pressure in big tanks. Well, we, then we have to worry about how do we move those tanks around? How do we get that gas to where it needs to be? And then you also have to think about, well, how do I fill up my car with this potentially very flammable gas? And can I fill it up in the same amount of time that I would normally fill up my, uh, my gas tank? Because that's what consumers will want. You don't want to have to wait at the gas station for 45 minutes while your car is getting refueled. And so if we just focus on the production at first, the way right now, hydrogen is primarily made on the industrial scale through coal gasification and steam reforming of natural gas. And effectively what that means is we react carbon, oxygen, and steam to make hydrogen. And so we're making hydrogen, but we're also consuming, um, we're, we're consuming carbon and we're emitting a lot of CO2 during this process. It would be great if we could split water, it has a potential to be much cleaner um, than, than the hydrogen produced via steam reforming or coal back gasification. However, it's expensive. So the energy produced from splitting water, doing water electrolysis, so taking water, splitting it into hydrogen and oxygen, uh, results in hydrogen that's much too expensive relative to a gallon of gasoline. Um, so steam reforming of natural gas, that's really how most hydrogen is made today. So even if you had a hydrogen car, today, your hydrogen would be coming from essentially methane because the, we run these processes at the industrial scale where we take methane, react it with steam, and effectively we're pulling the hydrogen atoms off of the methane 
to make hydrogen gas. And this reaction is run at very high temperatures. And if you ever boiled water, you know, you boil your pot of water, you fill up, let's say a four liter pot of water, you put it on your stove, you come back maybe 25 minutes later and it's boiling and all that time, your electric stove has been running at the highest heat, your gas stove has been running at the highest heat, you're making all this heat, only a small fraction of that heat actually ends up in that water. And it's kind of the same thing on the industrial scale, except of, instead of going up to boiling, we have to go up to much higher temperatures. And so the energy to heat up all that water comes from burning natural gas. So we're heating up all this water by burning natural gas, we're emitting CO2, and we do make hydrogen, but to heat up all that water, we're using an immense amount of energy and emitting a lot of CO2. So if, even if your car runs on hydrogen today, if it's not hydrogen produced by electrolysis where the, electroly or the electricity was made from a solar panel, that hydrogen manufacturing resulted in a lot of CO2 emissions. And so the United States produces a total of about 50 million, uh, 9 million tons of hydrogen per year. But it would be um, really ideal if look, thinking about the forefront of chemical engineering, if we could make something like this photoelectrochemical cell. And this cell, we put in sunlight and really nothing else. And by putting sunlight into this system, it works like a photovoltaic combined with a, with a, uh, with a, with a water splitting electrochemical cell. So the sunlight provides the energy to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. So sunlight shines in on this device, oxygen's evolved at one end, hydrogen's evolved at the other. You're making hydrogen really with just sunlight. Another way of doing this that chemical engineers can be involved in is through photobiological production. So we can think about using algae, genetically engineering algae or genetically engineering certain bacteria to be able to emit hydrogen as part of their photosynthetic cycle. So they take in CO2 from the air, they take in light and they run photosynthesis, but in, they take, um, in, instead of just, just using CO2 to, to grow, um, they emit some hydrogen as well. And a question is, can we engineer enzymes of these bacteria and of these algae to be able to uh, do this chemistry? <clears throat> so those are, those are a couple of general examples um, where chemical engineers can be involved in energy te technologies and moving to cleaner energy. One of my, uh, one, my, my uh, favorite chemical engineering problems to think about is the nitrogen cycle because the nitrogen cycle really has chemical engineering all the way through it and is so, so important for sustaining humanity. So the natural nitrogen cycle kind of follows this diagram here where we have nitrogen in the atmosphere through uh, electrical storms, nitrogen can get fixed and along with nitrogen fixing bacteria in the soil to make um, ammonium ions and ammonia, which nitrifying bacteria in the soil can make nitrates and these nitrates are essential for plant growth. Uh, plants must have uh, nitrogen in the soil to be able to make proteins, to be able to grow. Without nitrogen, without nitrates, we have no plant life, we have no animal life, we have no life on earth. And we can see as a direct result or as a consequence of nitrogen-based fertilizer, population has been skyrocketing really since the industrial revolution. And we've been able to sustain our population growth because of the growth of nitrogen fertilizer. So this plot just shows the consumption of nitrogen fertilizer in tons year over year. And we can see in 1960, we were less than 20 million uh, tons of nitrogen fertilizer. And as of 2014, we were greater than 100 million tons of nitrogen fertilizer. And you can correlate nitrogen fertilizer consumption directly to population growth. And so if we look at population pre-1950, in 1900, when we only had about a one and a half billion people on earth, nobody was sustained with a nitrogen-based fertilizer because we didn't know how to make it yet. We didn't have nitrogen-based fertilizer. We weren't producing it industrially. In the 50s, this started around uh, between World War I and World War II and really picked up during World War II. And after then, population really started to explode. And to the 70s, 80s, and to the 2000s, where today about 48%, probably more than that now, this is, this is a couple of years out of date, but about 50% of the world's population is sustained because of ammonia-based fertilizer. Without ammonia-based fertilizer, our population instead of 7 billion people would probably be more like 3 billion people. And it's absolutely essential for, for humanity. And chemical engineers 
were instrumental in this process. So Fritz Haber and Carl Bosch worked together. Uh, Fritz Haber was a, more of a chemist. He figured out how you could make ammonia from nitrogen gas in the air and hydrogen um, from, from methane. So they took the nitrogen and hydrogen and they tried thousands and thousands and thousands of different catalysts. They had like a poor grad student working for them. who was just doing experiment after experiment after experiment. And finally, they found the right combination of material um, to make liquid, to make ammonia. So they were able to make ammonia with the nitrogen and hydrogen. And now this process has gotten so efficient that the overall efficiency of the heat that goes in that forms the ammonia at the end is about 95%. And so this process has been around for, for a long, long time and has been optimized and optimized and is better and better and better. But it's an extremely, extremely energy intensive process. Making ammonia for nitrogen based fertilizer is responsible for about one to 2% of all energy consumed worldwide. So one to 2% of all energy, of all power at any given moment, about one to 2% of all energy goes into making this nitrogen based fertilizer. And that's, we're making about 140 million tons of it. Um, about 90% of all ammonia that's made goes into making fertilizer. And because of ammonia-based fertilizer, we're able to quadruple the usable land for, for crop growth on ice-free continents. If we didn't have ammonia-based fertilizer, we'd require about 50% of all ice-free land on planet Earth to feed everybody today, which is just an, an astounding amount of, um, of, of land that would be needed to, make, to, to, to feed humanity. And so when we think about ammonia production, and we think about this big number of about 2% or one to 2% of all our energy being consumed to make ammonia, that's associated with a lot of CO2 emissions. So making all this ammonia consumes a lot of energy, produces a lot of CO2. How can we reduce the CO2 consumption? Well, we think about, we have a nitrogen molecule, which is a nitrogen, a nitrogen with a triple bond. And that triple bond is one of the most difficult bonds in nature to, make, to break. And to break that bond and be able to take, pull that nitrogen apart into two nitrogen atoms, we need a catalyst. And so ultimately we want catalysts that have a low activation barrier. The lower the activation barrier, the faster the rate of reaction. So there's a, there's a really uh, um, um, big area of research now trying to figure out how do we make ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen or from even other compounds at lower temperature because the the potential for energy and, and CO2 savings is, is very, very high. And now there's, you can kind of think about integrating this all together with clean energy, where we'd ideally like to make some kind of a device where we take renewable energy, whether it's solar or wind, put them into this electrochemical cell. And one end we feed in water, the water gets split into oxygen and protons. These protons move across the membrane, react with nitrogen and air to make ammonia. And so this device, all we put in is air and water and electricity and wind. And what comes out is ammonia that we can use to feed the planet. And that's one way that chemical engineers can think about the problem. Another way is to think about something like peanuts, which is a legume. And legumes are a, a, a very interesting crop to be inspired by how we can change the way we think about ammonia-based fertilizers. So, in these peanuts are rhizoba, which are diazotropes. And diazotropes have a symbiotic relationship with the roots, roots of legumes, things like clover, alfalfa, beans, peanuts, peas, soy. They receive organic acids from the plant roots and they supply ammonia to the plant. So when you plant peanuts, you don't need any nitrogen-based fertilizer. The bacteria um, that are present that like to live in those roots do the work for us. And now the question is, in these diazotropes, there are these enzymes called nitrogenase enzymes. And these enzymes are what break nitrogen apart and break that triple bond. And so what we do in catalysis a lot of times is think about, well, if the enzymes look like this, how can we synthetically make something that looks like that, that can also uh, break apart nitrogen to be able to more efficiently make ammonia by putting in less energy? And so those are, those are a couple of examples of um, ways in which chemical engineers impact our world and the kinds of problems we solve. And when we think about chemical engineering jobs, um, we, 
we really kind of fit into the examples that 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 we that we discussed today. So doing things like improving energy efficiency, economics, environmental impact. We work with chemists to scale things up, like the COVID vaccine, for example. Uh, manage and supervise teams. So there's a lot of chemical engineers that make great managers and provide technical expertise to to customers. Another thing about chemical engineering, um, the major is we get a really good background in chemistry and math. We're very interested in solving or seeing theoretical concepts applied to real world problems. So when I was getting involved in engineering, one of the things that really caught my interest of chemi, I actually went into college as a physics major was my intent. And I changed my mind because physics for me was a little too abstract and theoretical. I liked the idea of being able to see what I made. And chemical engineering really gives you that opportunity because you're on pretty much every chemical engineering project, all, all the research, you can tie it to a very, very tangible application. And um, an another part about chemical engineering majors is we're intrigued by new materials, devices, processes, and careers. I have a couple listed here, but I know chemical engineers who have gone on to med school, to law school, who have gone on to academia, who have gone to work for companies like Intel, Exxon, um, worked for small startups in, in photovoltaics, worked for startups in organic LEDs. Um, chemical engineering is a very, very versatile major that really teaches you how you can apply these fundamental principles, such as uh, biology, chemistry, physics, math, with thermo, reaction engineering, separations, transport, to a whole wide variety of problems from clean energy, sustainability, biotechnology. There are many different areas um, that, that chemical engineering can be applied to. And we, um, we have this within our department here in chemical engineering. So we have relationships with LLE, URMC throughout uh, art sciences and engineering. Um, we, have, we have good graduate programs, both masters and PhD level programs. Um, we really emphasize our undergraduate program uh, uh, and uh, we have good relationships with local, national and global institutions. So to give you kind of a general snapshot of our department here at U of R, um, we're really strong in materials, especially surfaces and interfaces. Actually, I should update this. We have two faculty who retired, so we're now at nine primary tenure track, fac tenure track faculty. Um, we have support, several support staff, um, everyone we need to be able to successfully conduct our research and help you through your undergraduate program. Um, our total program is about 170 undergrads and um, we have collaborations throughout U of R. And so if we look at a typical degree program of what you'd be doing here at U of R, well, first year, uh, first year fall, I teach THE 150 Intro to Sustainable Energy. Um, this is technically an elective course that gives you a taste of chemical engineering and how it's applied to sustainable energy. Um, second semester, really just building the foundation that you'll need for their years. So for your, your sophomore fall, you get into a big class chemical process analysis, mass and energy balances, and then sophomore spring fluid dynamics. And then into their junior year is really the core of the chemical engineering curriculum. When you take the courses like thermo, heat and mass transfer, um, kinetics and reactor design, separations. That's really when the discipline comes into to its own and separates from the other engineering majors. And so if you're interested in chemi and you've already decided you like chemi classes, but you wanna get a little more involved and uh, make the most of your time here at U of R, there are plenty of opportunities to do that. For example, one of them is the Eisenberg Summer Internship Program. So it's in a competitive program within the chemi department that uh, is, is set up directly for chemi majors to participate in summer research uh, at U of R with chemical engineering faculty. And more than 50% of seniors who, who graduate from our program had summer research experience through um, some REU program, either at other universities, LLE, here in the Eisenberg program in industry or, or the Xerox program. So it's really important um, while you're here to, to make the most of your connections to go out to be able to do some research. So that kind of, um, gives you a broad overview of chemical engineering, some of the problems we solve, and um, what the department is like here at U of R. So if there's any questions, I think this would be a good time. I could take some questions. Otherwise, I can um, continue on too, and I can talk a little bit about my group's research and what we're up to specifically. We have a, so, a couple questions. Um, yeah. I can read to you. Um, from a perspective, parents, 
Um, their child is very torn between chemistry and chemical engineering, was trying to figure out what could, they could do before they get to college to figure out which one they should do. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think this is a great question that comes up a lot. And um, there's a lot more familiarity with chemistry at the high school level because you have chemistry classes. You can take chemistry, you can take AP chemistry. You have a really good sense of what chemistry is. Um, but then chemical engineering, it's a little more abstract. You don't really hear about it until uh, you get into your undergraduate education. And what I would, what I would kind of recommend is one thing you can do is look uh, on our department website. We have some resources that tell you where our graduates go and where they end up and what kind of jobs they, they have. And I, I believe the chemistry department has the same kind of um, information on their website. But one thing I'll say for sure is that with a chemical engineering degree after graduation, it, there's many more job opportunities available directly with a bachelor's than with a chemistry. With chemistry, a lot of times you'll need to go to grad school um, before you can, you can find uh, the type of employment that you're looking for. And chemical engineering, it's really set up um, so you can finish your, your bachelor's and directly go on to, to, to work in industry. But you don't have to work in industry. You can always also also go to grad school. And I really think chemical engineering is such a versatile major because you're learning how to apply your fundamental knowledge to important problems of humanity. And you can really see the connection between how your, your, uh, your work can, can directly impact humanity. And, 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 and um, you, can, you can apply the degree to so many different things. So like, even if you don't know what you want to do going into college, like if you graduate with a chemistry degree, you can go on to do many different things from uh, patent law to become a lawyer, to become a doctor, uh, go into academia, go work for an energy company, go work for, for some other company. There's, there's many, many opportunities, but I'm, I'm giving you a very biased explanation as a chemical engineer. Um, you'd have to, you, you, I, I would say just too, to try to talk to a chemist and see, and see what they have to say, if that, that'll help uh, with your decision. Uh, that's one of the best parts about doing this individually. You have the floor, right? So you have complete uh, uh, control over the, the dialogue. I like this. Um, one of the other questions that we had, and this is for is undergraduates, but um, I guess it could be applied to both industry or research. You know, how often does a, a chemical engineer work alone? How often do they work in groups? And usually what is the size of the group um, that, the, that chemical engineers normally work in? Right. I think... I think um... And in, in really in, in, in academia and industry more so, collaborations and interdisciplinary collaborations are absolutely essential. And I'll give you an example. Um, my group and some undergraduates, we just worked on a project for uh, trying to get money from Elon Musk. So Elon Musk just has recently pledged $100 million to carbon removal projects. And we are working on a project where we're trying to build an adsorption column to remove CO2 directly from the atmosphere. And so this, this column that we're trying to, to design and build that we've proposed, it has a lot of different components. So we have a material inside that likes to grab CO2 out of the air. We have this column that's really just a metal tube that we flow gas through. And we have to think about, well, how big a fan do we need to put on to blow enough gas through? How much pressure do we need to apply to the system? What temperature do we want it at? How do we control the temperature? Um, how do we measure if we've captured CO2? So we need sensors on the inlet and the outlet to tell us how much CO2 is being captured. And on this project, we, had, we were working with all different disciplines. So we had mechanical engineers to help us think about what we're going to design the column out of and what it's going to look like. We had chemical engineers thinking about pressure drop and what materials we could use to grab the CO2. We had electrical engineers who are helping us design sensors that can sense the CO2 and the concentration coming in and coming out and also sense things like relative humidity. Because overall, we'd really like this to be an integrated process where it runs, it's collecting air, the column is completely saturated and then we stop collecting air and we regenerate the CO2. <coughs> and so we did this problem in academia, but if you were working in industry on the same type of problem, you'd be working with a big team of mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, chemical engineers all working together with your putting your different disciplines and your expertises uh, contributing to this one overall problem, but figuring out how your, how all of these pieces fit together to solve the, the common goal. 
So, so I, I don't really have an answer in terms of the size of the teams. That probably really depends on the size of the company that you'd work for and the specific project. But um, with certainty, I can tell you that chemical engineering is, is really a collaborative discipline. And I guess you, you mentioned this, this was one of the questions in terms of interdisciplinary opportunities. You know, what disciplines are uh, work with chemical engineers the most? Yeah, I think, I think there's like, like mechanical engineers can be a natural fit. Like in the example I gave, um, electrical engineers can be a good fit. Um, biomedical engineering and chemical engineering can go hand in hand a lot of times. There's um, a bio side of chemical engineering, like when we were talking about um, engineering bacteria to make specific enzymes to produce hydrogen. You could think of that as a biomedical engineering problem, but some chemical engineers will also think of that as a chemical engineering problem. So there's, there's definitely some distinct overlap there. And we talked about too, you can have collaborations with just uh, with, with scientists as well, like chemists and chemical engineers, that's a, that's a really key collaboration. So if you're working for, let's say, let's say a, a big company, a chemist in the, in the company may discover some new drug or, or, or some new uh, material and will say, well, how do we make, we, we can make this on one gram of it, but to really have an impactful process, we need to make a hundred tons of it. So how do we go from one gram to a hundred tons? And that's where the chemical engineer and the chemist really need to talk to figure out how this is going to uh, be a scalable process. All right, great. I, yeah, I think we could turn to your research now. Sure. So I'll talk uh, the last 15 minutes or so, I'll give you a quick overview of what we're up to in my lab. And we're really interested in making new catalysts to convert carbon dioxide into useful things. And so if we look at this, image, it's a NASA satellite image of the Earth's atmosphere where CO2 is infrared absorbent. And so it shows up opaque and dark red on this graph. And so if you're paying really careful attention, you'll notice or realize that this image was taken when it's winter in the Northern Hemisphere. In the Northern Hemisphere, all the plant life is dormant. So there's not as much plant life sucking in CO2. So the CO2 concentration accumulates in the atmosphere. And this photo is really a result of one of the most famous chemical engineering equations that I talk with my first years about, which is input minus output plus generation equals accumulation. We're inputting more CO2 in the atmosphere than the earth can remove. And so effectively CO2 is accumulating in the atmosphere. And the accumulation of atmospheric CO2 is a result of things like methane, um, gasoline, coal burning, Etc. And so we can tabulate up all the CO2 emissions in terms of a carbon equivalent. And uh, we're emitting roughly nine, 10 gigatons of carbon equivalent of CO2 each year. So effectively what we wanna do is bring this dashed line down. We wanna emit less CO2 in the atmosphere. And the way we can do that is through increased efficiency, cleaner energy, carbon sequestration. And uh, eventually in, when we capture that carbon, can we convert that CO2 into other things. Well, if you, if you think into the future and you're really optimistic, you might say, well, we don't have to worry about this problem. This problem is just gonna go away on its own because carbon dioxide emissions are on the decline. So over the past several years, CO2 emissions have been decreasing. But if you look very carefully at this graph, you'll see that this is really just a result of coal is on the decline and natural gas starting around 2008 has been increasing and natural gas is a little more efficient than coal. And as a result, our emissions have been declining. Um, you could imagine in the future, if you're really optimistic, well, we'll just be on uh, solar panels and wind turbines and we'll be able to drive our cars in space like Elon Musk and we don't have to worry about CO2 because we can go live on Mars instead. Um, even though the atmosphere of Mars is 95% carbon dioxide. Um, and to, to further add to this, it's been recently announced by several car makers that they're gonna sell zero emission vehicles by within the next 15 years or so. And so you could think this is great. This problem is just gonna kind of go away on its own. We're not gonna have to worry about carbon dioxide. Um, we're on the path to being carbon neutral, but that's really not the case. CO2 emissions are in fact here to stay. So it's projected that um, into the future that we're gonna continue using natural gas um, eventually, we're going to start running out of crude oil, so we're going to have to use less of that by 2050. Good news is renewable energy is definitely expected to increase, 
but um, low cost coal is definitely expected to still stick around. Um, nuclear will be around and we'll still have hydroelectric power. So CO2 will definitely be here to stay. And if we look at projections for the, the, what, what the, our temperature rise will look like going to the future associated with these emissions, um, right now we're around here at 2020. And if we project ourselves into the future using these different models, the worst case scenario puts us on this trajectory where we're emitting, where we get up to more than a thousand parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. Right now we're at around 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And if we're on this red trajectory by the year 2100, it's expected the Earth's average temperature will be, it will increase by 3.2 to 5.4 degrees C. Just uh, hard to imagine what the effects of those temperature, that temperature rise will be. But a much more optimistic take tells us that we'll be able to get to net zero CO2 emissions by the year 2070. And I think that's a really ambitious goal. Maybe we don't get there by 2070, but if you're somebody who's really ambitious and you think that, that, that you, want, you, know, you want to stay optimistic and solve this carbon problem to sequester or get rid of all the CO2 that's, that's projected to be produced by this natural gas, we have to start thinking right now how we can get on this curve and bend this CO2 emission curve downward. So what can we do to get to net negative global emissions? What can we do to stop emitting as much CO2? And the good news is there have been a lot of people thinking about this. So for example, a company Climeworks in Iceland, they've figured out that we can pump CO2 into the basalt rock in the earth and that mineralizes as carbonates and 95% of the CO2 that gets pumped into the earth stays there indefinitely. There's another company, Carbon Engineering in Western Canada, They've, uh, their process as they've scaled it up has gotten cheaper and cheaper. They can capture CO2 for about $100 a ton. Just a few years ago, it was about $600 a ton. Um, also in Iceland, Carbon Recycling International, a small company that converts carbon dioxide into methanol. They make about 4,000 tons of methanol per year. And again, I mentioned before, um, maybe you wanna escape Earth and move to Mars. Well, the Martian atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide. So we start thinking about long-term missions to Mars. Well, we wanna utilize that atmosphere, that carbon dioxide, how do we use it? Well, there's CO2 in the atmosphere, there's water in the ice on the planet. We can use solar energy to split that water into hydrogen and oxygen. We react that hydrogen with CO2. We can start making things like hydrocarbons, ethylene, polyethylene, and we're off to the races in terms of what we can do on Mars with the resources that are available. Um, a lot of this is to some extent done already aboard the International Space Station. So on the International Space Station, everything is really, really expensive because it has to be flown up uh, above into, into Earth's orbit. And so on the International Space Station, what they do is the astronauts are emitting CO2 as part of cellular respiration. And they import hydrogen onto the International Space Station. They react that hydrogen with the CO2 that they capture aboard the space station, and they form methane and water. Water is really good because now they've recovered oxygen that the, that the astronauts have emitted and they can take that water, they can drink it, they can split the oxygen, the, the water into hydrogen and oxygen to breathe that oxygen. Um, but what's, what's, what's difficult about this process is they reject the methane into space. They just shoot it out because they have no use for it aboard ISS. And so if you pay close attention to your stoichiometry here, you'll see we're putting in uh, four moles of hydrogen gas, but two of those moles end up in methane, which gets sent into space. So half the hydrogen that we spend all this money and energy to shoot up to ISS just gets dumped into space. Um, so NASA is looking into other types of reactions to more efficiently use carbon dioxide. So instead of rejecting all that, uh, that hydrogen, can we make just carbon and water? So that carbon is a solid, we can just store it or just throw it into space. Um, and that water, then we're using 100% of the hydrogen that gets brought on board to make water that the astronauts can drink, that, that, that um, we can split into hydrogen and oxygen for, for, for them to breathe. And this could have ramifications here on planet Earth, where now maybe we have a process to make solid carbon out of our CO2 while also um, making water, thereby fixing carbon in the atmosphere. And so I've also been directly involved in one of these uh, CO2-based projects. Uh, I have a collaboration with the United States Naval Research Lab, 
where they're trying to convert seawater into jet fuel aboard aircraft carriers. And aircraft carriers are nuclear powered. They have a nuclear reactor that can keep the, the, uh, the aircraft carrier running at sea for about 50 years. However, if we think about um, the times of war, um, these aircraft carriers have a limited amount of jet fuel to power their fighter jets. So they'll have to refuel at some point. And during wartime, fuel supply lines are very vulnerable. So how, so is there a way that this floating city can make fuel as it's fueled for the fighter jets as it's floating around? And one way they can do that is by removing some dissolved CO2 that's present in the ocean and also splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen. So the US Navy has this cation exchange module that seawater goes in, it gets split into hydrogen and oxygen. We take the hydrogen. We also remove the dissolved CO2. The hydrogen and CO2 can then be uh, pressurized and reacted to make jet fuel. And so you need a lot of seawater to make, to make uh, jet fuel, but um, in, this would also be among some of the most expensive jet fuel that you could make, but for the, for the Navy and, and the Department of Defense, a strategic advantage really has no cost. And, may, and maybe um, we could think about making this process more efficient and thinking about ways to convert CO2 into other useful things. So for example, my group, we study um, this first reaction here, thinking about CO2 fissure tropes, so being able to convert CO2 into something like propylene. So rather than make uh, all these polymers from crude oil, can we make these polymers from renewable hydrogen and CO2 from the atmosphere? And so we've looked at all different types of catalysts to do this reaction. This reaction won't just happen on its own. We need to put something in there to speed it up. And one of the types of materials that we've worked with is molybdenum carbide. So molybdenum carbide is a metal carbide that has catalytic properties that are similar to very expensive precious metals like platinum, palladium, ruthenium, but it's much, much lower cost and they're much more abundant. And so this molybdenum carbide catalyst is pretty active for CO2 reduction from its unique oxygen storage properties. And we showed in a paper that we published last summer that our molybdenum carbide catalyst here, in terms of how fast it can make CO2 is on the order of that of precious metal catalysts like rhodium and platinum. So in terms of the rate we're producing CO2, so how much CO2 we're making per amount of catalyst per day versus the cost of the metal in the material. Um, although platinum and rhodium are a little faster than our catalyst, they're much, much more expensive, where molybdenum is a much cheaper metal. And so you have the balance of cost and performance in this carbide catalyst that we made. And so in my lab, to do this kind of chemistry and to, and to come up with these findings, we use all different types of reactors. We have an FTIR, which uses infrared radiation to tell us about what's happening on the surface of that catalyst. We have a flow reactor where we flow through gas into a gas chromatograph to help us separate out all the compounds that we make with our catalyst to be able to tell exactly how much CO2 is being reacted and uh, what kinds of compounds we're making. And so that gives you kind of a general overview of what my group has been up to. Um, here's a group photo of us. And we had some exciting news last summer. Um, that work that we published with the Naval Research Lab uh, got picked up by the local news media and some of my students and myself got to be on local channel eight. So that was a really fun experience. Um, so maybe if you become a chemical engineer, you'll also get an opportunity to be on TV. Um, but that, that, that's all I, I have for you today. Thanks so much for your attention. I'm happy to sit for a few minutes and answer any more questions that have come up. All right, excellent. Please, please put in your last minute questions for Dr. Porosoff in the chat or on the Facebook page. Um, one of the questions that, that we deal with um, as advisors and we like to hear the perspective from faculty is, uh, a lot of times with undergrads, it's their first uh, dealing with consistent failure, right? Not necessarily in the, in the classroom, but getting exposed to research and understanding like how much failure needs to happen before something positive does. Can you talk a little bit about what failure and success look like in chemical engineering? Yeah, um, so I mean, I think, I think this is a, a really great question and it can be at times hard to stay motivated, especially when you run experiment after experiment and it's just the results aren't showing you what you think. And I'll, I'll, an, an example of this is something that um, happened with one of my students. So she's studying this catalyst that's really tricky to, to make it. And effectively what we're trying to do is put like a catalyst inside of 
a catalyst. So like catalysis inception in a, in a way to be able to control the, the, the reaction a little more precisely. And um, she collected data on this catalyst and showed me the data and versus the control, it showed no improvement at all. And so she came to me really upset and said, well, this is it, it's over, the project's done. We have to work on something else now. And I, I said to her, I was like, why, why do you think that? She said, it's the same as the control. And I asked her, well, have you measured this catalyst at all? Have, do you know what it looks like? And by that, I mean, do you know you actually put this one catalyst inside the other, or do you only just think you did? Because it's one thing to follow the steps of her procedure and say, you're, let's say you're at home and you're trying to make chicken Parmesan and you follow this recipe, but you pages stuck together and you end up making like chicken franchise instead. It's like, that's not necessarily a, a failure. You just maybe didn't follow the, the instructions properly. And so maybe she did follow the instructions correctly, but um, she hasn't done the characterization experiment that really tell you what this is that we made. And so we started asking a lot of questions. Well, what does this catalyst actually look like? Like when we look at it under a microscope, is it what we think we made? Um, can we, do we, do we know what the structure of the catalyst is? So all these questions came up that we really haven't answered yet. And I think failure is really a way, it's part of the learning process. I think it's really how you learn. So like when I was in grad school, pretty much every piece of equipment I worked with broke at one point or another. And I wouldn't know as much as I do about how the equipment works, unless I was the one in there who was responsible to fix it. There was, I couldn't go to my advisor who, was, who, was, who hadn't been in the lab in probably decades and tell him, hey, can you come down here? I don't know what to do. I was pretty much on my own. It was me, the manual, on the phone with technical support, trying to figure out how do we get this thing working again? And um, you go through several cycles like that where things just don't work. It seems like everything's not going your way, but ultimately you come out a lot stronger and more knowledgeable on the other end. So it's just key, take breaks, Stay motivated, stay focused. It can be really hard in times like this um, with COVID and everything. It seems like it's getting a little better. We're not quite uh, in as many Zoom meetings every day anymore, but um, still like it's, it's important to, to take breaks and, and pursue some passions and then also really balance your schedule and, and, and stay motivated because like, although it may hurt when you're, when you're getting these failures one after another, just think about how you're learning from this and what you can take out of it. Don't get discouraged, get motivated to be better and um, and, and, and learn from the experience. <clears throat> Excellent. I, I think that that is a perfect place to stop, especially considering um, we also have, uh, you know, current students, first year, first semester students who are considering coming to chemical engineering. And I think that my next question is that what sort of advice do you have for them? But I think you encapsulated it in your answer uh, regarding failure. So I, I, we appreciate you spending your time. You've done this multiple times for us. And, and I know how difficult and busy it is for you. Thank you for spending the time to be able to do this uh, so that students can know a little bit more about not only what you do, um, but what we do within, within the Hajim School. Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's my pleasure. I'm always happy to try to convert more people into, into chemical engineering and get them to, to realize what a great discipline it is. Well, excellent. We're going to put Dr. Porosoff's um, information on the uh, Facebook page so that you can learn a little bit more about him, um, including uh, the Channel 8 um, uh, broadcasts. Um, that brings us to our conclusion for today. Um, as I said before, next Friday is with biomedical engineering, same time. Um, there will be a link uh, put on the Hajim Facebook page, um, but it will also uh, be available uh, in Instagram and, and YouTube. So we're going to stop our broadcast for now. Um, like I said, we really are very happy that you were able to join us today, um, and we will see you next week. Thank you. All right.